Never in my wildest dreams did I think that a go-karting party in Southend Adventure Island would end up as P2 at Silverstone Race Circuit. This is the story of my son Brandon Abraham and how he became a racing driver. This is the road to Silverstone. One of the first times Brandon's talent for piloting vehicles, I use the word piloting deliberately, was when he used to play video games on the simulators at home and his hand-eye coordination was quite extreme. So at the age of four years old is when I first thought racing was for me. So. I used to play loads of racing games all the time and uh, yeah, just for fun at the time. But yeah, I really enjoyed it and it just felt natural to me. And then um, there was a time, because he was so interested in cars, I took him to the XL car show. And while there, he was, um, he was on the Ferrari simulator and the actual Ferrari simulator it was almost too big for him with the way they'd set him up in there. He was eight years old. And um, I remember the gentleman called me over and he said to me, is that your son? And I thought, oh, what's he done now? And um, he said, well, just to say that he's got the highest score of everybody all day who's used the sim. And, you know, that switched the light on in my head. I asked Dad if I could go for a birthday at karting. Um, yeah, and a few years later he took me to a birthday party at South End with some more of my school friends, but it was a bit more serious. And then we were all on there having fun, and there were other people, and I suspect the locals were there as well. And um, it came apparent to people that Brandon seemed to be passing everybody and continuously lapping people, myself included. We had a bit of a competitive nature, but yeah, I ended up lapping some adults who were there randomly like three times. And um, you could see that the locals were really trying hard and, you know, they were getting quite upset with the fact that this guy, this young guy from nowhere, apparently, was, um, you know, ruling on their turf as such. And then, you know, in my mind, it, it kind of left a mark in my mind. And I said to myself, you know, as soon as I get back to London, I'm going to find a place where he can do go-karting, you know, as something that he could just get into. I didn't really at that time think to myself, right, he's going to be a racing driver. But I thought it was definitely something he was interested in. And, um, and when we did get back to London, I did some inquiries and I found a place called um, Team Sport in Edmonton, which was quite local to us. Um, so we went to Team Sport Edmonton, which is a really nice facility. Um, yeah, and I ended up coming fourth for my first ever race, so it was really good. But um, yeah, after that, we just thought it was for me. So yeah, we wanted to progress through there. Yeah, Brandon really took to it. And um, we made it a regular thing. And as time went by, Brandon established himself as one of the main contenders there, consistently winning, consistently achieving podiums and going well beyond that. As I went through my career in indoor karting, there was no issues I could think of. It was perfect for me. I used to go every single week. So if I make a mistake one week, I knew I'd come out next week and do better. Not only was he beating, you know, the normal people who came there, he was also competing and beating the staff as well. He was laying down new markers and he was setting lap records and he was the one he was the one to beat 
So as in indoor karting, I was mostly winning and I was doing very well there. So my emotions were really high. I was confident in myself. I knew, you know, in my head, I thought, yeah, I'm the best, you know, and I thought I could beat nearly everyone that came up against me. One thing comes to mind is that there's something called Chase the Ace, which Team Sport ran as an event. And what it meant was that if you won the event, the next time you were invited to the event, and you did not have to, you know, you didn't have to pay. You were like, you know, you were the, you were the ace and then everyone had to beat you. So it was almost like last man standing. But the only thing with that, because Brandon was so good, Brandon kept winning Chase the Ace. And for about three months, Brandon kept coming back as the ace and you know, on occasion, sometimes Brandon was lapping some of his closest competitors, you know, three, four, five times. You know, I would say he gradually outgrew indoor karting and he forced me to find him another challenge. And that's when I took him outside to face the competition outside. So at about 10 years old, in the middle of my team sport karting career, um, I met someone called Shane White and his dad Anthony. They introduced us to competitive karting, they told us all about it as they started doing it first. And um, yeah, we were in team sport for a bit while they were still doing that, but then eventually we led on to what they were saying and we got into it. And we got introduced to the team that they were racing with, um, it was called Intrepid. As I transitioned out of the karting, it was tough. Obviously, the competition out there was a lot higher and the quality of people out there were much stronger. So, it yeah, it took a bit of adjusting to and my equipment wasn't also up to par with theirs. So that also gave me a disadvantage. What's your name and how old are you? My name's Brandon Abraham and I'm 13 years old. So where are we right now? Um, we're at Walton Mill in Northamptonshire. Even at that stage, money was very important and how much money you had um, and it kind of related to the team you could be with it related to the equipment you had it re related to the reliability of the equipment that you had and you know they decided the winning of the race the winning and the losing of the race eight down getting slippery eight down oh Zivia's off Brandon Brandon you know, we went through quite a lot of um, disappointment. You know, it's never always been all about winning and everything's been successful and he's just gone from strength to strength in that way. You know, we've had to put up with lots of, um, you know, breakdowns, technical issues and um, sometimes equipment not being adequate at all. Eventually, throughout the season, my equipment started to um, lack in quality, so I started to break down, for example, um, in top six positions. So, yeah, the emotions were pretty tough. I knew all my championship was whittling away from me, getting a top 10 in the UK, um, seeded so number. You know, the cost in itself, every, every weekend was, you know, a struggle to get there. It wasn't a case of, you know, having all the facilities. We had to do various things, you know. I had to work, I had to drive up and down to the race locations while still working. We were travelling loads, staying in hotels loads, yeah, which is great. Um, shout out for Dad for taking it on the chin and driving me up the hours, coming back and doing work, so he had a really strong heart for that. At any stage, I think, if we gave up at any stage, you know, I, I think people would have turned around to us and said, you know what, I can understand why you give up, because that's very, very hard, and, you know, you can understand why someone wouldn't want to continue. But we didn't do that and um, you know it's always been my motto to both my children that you know you, you've got to sometimes you've got to stand up and be counted and um, you know I'm happy to say we've stood up and we were counted and when we were counted it turns out Brandon's one of the special ones.
he's always raced against the odds. It's nothing that I feel, I don't feel bad about the situation because my budget was inadequate. I don't think, doesn't matter how much money I had, I don't think my, my budget would have ever been, ever been adequate. That's almost sometimes what the, um, the budget and the cost of it can be, that sometimes it's almost never enough. And in the end, talent is the only thing that makes a difference. Brandon just went from strength to strength in karting and he did something called um, Super One, which was the, the elite racing within in Great Britain, this country-wise, called Super One. He then went to something called X30 Junior, which was a faster class. So when I started coming against really good people was when I went to Junior X30. So my first ever race in the class, I managed to finish in fourth place in most of my races and fifth, I think, no, eighth in the final. Yeah, but there was a massive grid and the competition was really tough. There was a lot of drivers who were really tough in there and I used to look up to a lot of them before I went into the class. So, yeah, um, I showed them respect and, yeah, it was respectful racing on track. And, yeah, some of them might have been better than me at the time. But, yeah, I slowly progressed and I thought, OK, eventually I'll become as good as these guys. And, yeah, throughout the year, the first few races of the year, I was up with them running at the front. First race, I was fourth, fifth and sixth in my in final. So, yeah, I did really well and I was up with them all the time. Looking at Brandon, Brandon Abraham. Abraham. And he's got Shane White and Joe Fowler on the toe. Now, this is going to be interesting. Herbert and Matt Hudson. Look at this battle on track, though. The 15, Brandon Abraham, is having to defend Big Star. Beautiful, absolutely textbook. Cracking move. Seventh place battle is what we need to be watching now. Brandon Abraham getting a lot of challenge from Joe Fowler. Tenth position up for grabs as well. It was fast becoming a realisation that he was going to be a racing driver. And the next thing we did was try to find out how, how we can get him into cars. So the transition from karting to cars was a long and tough one. Um, and at the end of 2017, we finished the Super 1 season. And yeah, we were lucky enough to compete in the Janetta Scholarship. Janetta Scholarship was, if you got through, you would get a fully funded season racing Janetta Juniors in the, um, the Janetta Junior Championship. My friends did it as well, so like they always used to talk about it. So I kind of knew an idea of what I was getting into. Brandon had never driven a car before. So what I had to do, I had a friend, his name was Bradley Smith, fantastic guy. He's one of the best drivers in this country and, and, and very well known and, and a world champion as well. And um, he took Brandon to a simulator and gave Brandon four hours on the simulator coaching on the Friday before the event. Yeah, so a more progressive brake on the way in. We can brake later. The steering wheel basically tells you what the car is doing, but it's not creating the problem. That's also gravel. So if we can get that later brake point with the right kind of braking style. I got trained by Bradley Smith there for about four hours the, the Friday before the scholarship. So yeah, it was a great experience getting some time in a simulator, which is pretty close to the um, car in real life. And then we went down to the Janetta Scholarship on the Monday and Brandon was driving the car after having never driven a car or sat in a car in that way before. So I went to the scholarship, got into the car for the first time and then was instantly hooked. It was a great machine. Obviously I had to get used to the clutch and stuff first, but I have most of my time on simulators at home. So I'm on the pedals all the time there. So I had an idea where I was going and what I was doing. Brandon qualified and got through to the finals. And then we had to stay up there for another two days because Brandon managed to best 40 other people and get into the the last qualifying stage into the finals so yeah throughout the day it was really good we managed to get through to the finals that day as well so yeah, it was a great achievement for me the hard thing about that was that to get into the Janetta championship without the scholarship was impossible the the cost was um you know beyond us and way beyond our budget 
potential. So everything was us on us was was based on Brandon's talent and you know how I could put us in a position where someone could see how good he was and then possibly consider sponsoring us or sponsoring Brandon in that way. So you know that's what we had to work with. And then we were thinking how could I get Brandon into cars? And I looked at the Mazda Championship. It looked like it could be affordable, you know, barely affordable for us. But what I also looked at was the fact that if I could get somehow a way for him to at least do one race and to do a race which had enough prestige and caught enough attention that we could use that to, as a momentum to, to catapult Brandon where we wanted him to go and to get people to see him. And so the first race of the season for Mazda, the first, the first race was um, Brands Hatch and we were too early for that, we missed that. And um, so we had to make a different plan. And the plan was, and the only plan was Silverstone. Hence the name, The Road to Silverstone. The Road to Silverstone is quite interesting because it's about branding achieving, but also the actual Road to Silverstone was a task in itself. So there were two things running simultaneously next to each other. The making of the Road to Silverstone and actually the making of the racing driver. And they were both happening at the same time. So it was a great video, um, very hard working. The stages were, I would be first be filming a running track where I'd be running around um, and a drone would be following me. I mean, which was very hard, a hard day, very sweaty. It was like some days were 30 degrees, but you know, at the end of the day, I remember him telling me, um, it will be all hard now, but eventually it will all pay off and I remember, which obviously it has. So yeah, um, big thanks to him for the advice and yeah, the motivation to keep pushing forward. After that, we started filming APSM, where we were training throughout the months leading up to the race, which it was great, catching all the hard work the guys do there with me and getting me prepped for, for the um, race at the end of the year. So yeah, after that, we did um, filming at my home. So all the achievements and stuff we have here and everything that you know we do at my, my facility at home. So yeah, it was a great recording all that stuff, seeing all some behind the scenes of what goes on, not to the track. It was a strategic thing chance that we took. It was about the last throw of the dice and it was a strategic plan to show our journey and I mean the real journey it's not none of this is um, a fake or made up situation this is exactly what we did. We deliberately created the video to show the truth about Brandon not to not to build up some picture which is not what he is or what he's about. What we actually tried to do was capture the reality and what, what we were really doing and trying to show people actually this was the last ditch and this is a situation where actually if this doesn't turn out well then that's how the story ends. So the, the making of The Road to Silverstone was a collaboration between myself, Brandon and and Nan Tawari from Anari TV. You know, it was a collaboration between us. And um, it was, I suppose also it was a kind of, um, Anan was making his kind of first video like this with that kind of concept and idea. And we were trying to capture the reality of our situation. So the road to Silverstone, as I said, there's two things happening. There is the creating of the video, which in itself is a journey, and the creating of telling the story and narrating the story of the racing driver, who is Brandon. 
after that um, in the 2018 season, it was more about preparing for what we were going to do in the 2019 season. So in 2018, around mid 2018, I joined the iZone Winter Development Programme. Um, yeah, which was a really good experience, and yeah, it was they have, they have a great facility there. So I was training for a few months there, and um, yeah, at the end of my training um, schedule, I was lucky enough to be put on the Andy Pierre Sports Management Programme. Andy Pierre Sports Management, I was being trained mentally, physically, and obviously on the simulator, um, dietary plan as well, and uh, yeah, they gave me an app to work out when I was at home. So the training there is really good. I was being lasered around track to focus on my visualisation, so looking ahead, I'm on the apexes and on the exits. Uh, my minimum and maximum, which is basically your throttle input into corners and how much throttle you're putting on into the corner and out the corner. Um, yeah, so basically how much um, minimum speed you're keeping up. So yeah, it, that was really good and that improved your pace by so, so much. So yeah, the training throughout the uh, months wrecking up to that Silverstone race has really, really helped me. And yeah, maybe perform how I did at the weekend. But yeah, everyone at APSM, um, they're brilliant guys. And yeah, I recommend any driver who wants to become a star of the future to, to go on board with them guys because they're brilliant people. So yeah, um, the weekend for my first race at Silverstone, yeah, this was um, my, my day of reckoning and this is, the stakes were so high um, leading up to this. So yeah, I knew I had to perform. After all the years of karting, um, all the effort, every week, day in, day out, going indoor karting, um, traveling all over Britain, it was gonna come down to this. It was a uh, yeah, mixed emotions of, you know, I'm finally going to get there, race on the iconic Silverstone circuit and also, okay, I have to form. And yeah, we're really there and really doing this, you know. Okay, this is my moment, this is my moment to shine. I've had to prove myself to so many people. It's either you do it or you don't. And it was make or break. And, um, well, if you look at the next episode, you'll see how it turned out.